You're listening to the Wake Up Wealthy Podcast, the only podcast that helps you turn pro in mind, body, spirit, and business. What is up, Wake Up Wealthy listeners? Welcome to the Wake Up Wealthy Podcast, where we show you how to max out mind, body, spirit, and business. Today, we have Ryan Stuman with us today. You may know him as the Hardcore Closer. Ryan, how are you? What's going on, Brody, man? Appreciate you having me on here, dude. Appreciate it, man. And uh, we're going to bring some we're gonna bring some heat to him today, I promise. Yeah, awesome. I'm pumped, man. So, you know, for the listeners, Ryan and I got connected out at uh, M3. Ryan was putting on that event with uh, Josh Madrid, and I was speaking on a panel, on a sales panel out there. So we had never met before, got connected. I uh, hit him up again, said I really enjoyed Really enjoyed our conversation and wanted to uh, wanted to do it a little more in depth and in front of you guys. So, dude, for the guys who are listening to this who don't know who you are, most of them probably do. But for the ones who don't, why don't you give a little synopsis of uh, you know who you are, what you do? Well, first, if you don't know me, I apologize. I uh, I must have screwed up somewhere along the way. But hopefully, you get to know me throughout the course of this podcast, which is why I do things like this. But. Uh, You know, I started off in uh, sales at a young age, 13. I've never had a salary job in my life. And uh, I've had a a life of extreme highs and, you know, rock bottom with a jackhammer lows. And sales has been the only thing that's ever, like, been able to get me out of any jam I'm ever in. No matter what jam I've ever been in in my life, making a few, it was always just a few sales. The solution was always just a few sales away. And... In 2010, I was one of the top loan officers in the country, and like overnight, I lost my ability to do mortgages. Uh, I had been charged back in 2005 with federal uh, firearms trafficking. It's a long story, another podcast, but long story short, the feds wouldn't give me a license when 2010, the, the mortgage licenses switched from state to federal, and the feds, since I was still on federal parole, wouldn't give me a license. And so I got into internet marketing, not like instantly. I wasn't like, well, okay, leave mortgage, pivot into internet marketing. It wasn't like that at all. Uh, I was looking for something that didn't require a license, obviously (laughs) something that I didn't have a boss. I could make my own rules. I could dress how I wanted to. And one of my buddies is like, dude, like not just one, tons of my friends were like, Hey, you're the best sales guy I've ever met. This one particular one. So why don't you teach other people? And I'd always been like really secretive with, with my methods because it's, it's how I dominated the competition, right? And, uh, and he's like, well, since you're not in mortgages anymore, at least you could teach mortgage people how you did what you did. And, uh, and I thought, okay, so maybe I'll get into that. So I started an internet marketing product. The next thing you know, nothing fucking changed. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. It wasn't like, you know, dude, I'm in, the, I'm in a very, very nice house now. I have nice cars and everything else. But it wasn't like that at all you know i've been doing it for 10 years now well nine years and uh full time and you know now we have an eight figure per year business that i run and everything else but uh i've been through i've experienced just about everything you could experience on the negative as a business owner and i partially think that's because i did it intentionally just so i could have those experiences because i think you got to do experiments to gain experience so you can become an expert. So now when I consult people, teach people and all that stuff, dude, I'm speaking from experiences and I've sold everything from B2B dildos, I ain't even bullshitting, all up to freaking people that do CBD and sell marijuana to mortgages, real estates, business, commercial businesses, like you name it, I've either sold it or helped someone along the way. Sold it, we've had over 16,000 clients in the last four years come through our our, uh, academies. Pretty big stuff, man. Yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty big number, man. So there's a lot to there's a lot to unpack there, um, and and I I like I like to go briefly into you know some of the things that happened. Okay, so you said you started selling at 13. Um, where was it that you like really were starting to make income as a salesman, like good income? Well, so it's kind of weird. So I, I, at like eight years old, I started mowing the yards of these car washes that my stepdad was the manager of. And so one thing I noticed is after I finished, when I was about 10, after I finished mowing the yard, they would, uh, could you imagine an eight year old mowing a commercial company's yard these days? Fucking Twitter would be on fire with offense. You know what I mean? Like he's got a little kid mowing the yard. What the fuck? Back then, that's how we learned hard work, you know? (laughs) Uh, But so... At 10 years old, when I finished mowing the yard, my grandpa, my, my stepdad would just leave me on site. And when I finished mowing the yard, they would pay me $3.85 an hour to vacuum cars. 
I didn't drive them. I didn't pull them up, anything. I just run the hose over the seats and the carpet sucking all the crap out of there, right? It's probably the safest job at the car wash. What I realized is the dude that sold car washes didn't have to vacuum the cars. So like immediately I start asking my stepdad, hey man, let me uh, be the ticket writer. <clears throat> you know, and he's like, you can't have a little 10 year old talking to, you know, people when they pull into our business here. And so when I was 13, I finally convinced them to let me do it. The cool thing about the car wash, man, and, and, the, and, and the, how it relates to your question that you asked me, is some days we washed a thousand cars in a day. And I got to talk to all of them. So I learned rejection, fast numbers, you know what I mean? I learned how to get my pitch just right so I didn't spend too much time, so I didn't piss people off and take away their opportunity to buy and demeanor and all that stuff, dude. So I really, I did that for about 10 years, man. So I made, you know, shit, probably a million sales working there. You know, if we were doing an average of 10,000 cars a month and I worked there for 10 years, I don't know what all that adds up to, but it's a lot of fucking cars, you know what I mean? You worked there from the time you, there from the time you were a kid till you left high school? until I was 23 or 24. Oh, no shit. And so yeah. I, I didn't go to high school. I, the last grade that I finished was eighth grade and I attended the ninth grade, didn't, didn't pass it and then just said, fuck it. I was already making $400 a week. <laughs> I know it sounds funny, but this is, this is the 90s. I was already making $400 a week working at this car wash part-time. So I thought, well, if I just quit, I'll go make sales because I got like a nickel a car. I'll go make sales at the car wash and I'll make 40 or $50,000. Fuck, my teachers ain't making that right now. Yeah, and where'd you grow up at? And I didn't like school anyway, so I was like, well, screw it. Then I'll just eventually work up my way to, to run this car wash. But, but what happened was I met somebody at the car wash that sold drugs and that was, you know, supposedly looked like a hell of a lot better business opportunity at the time. So when I was about 17, I work at the car wash during the day and I'm selling drugs and shit at night. And, Obviously, I wasn't very good at selling drugs. I ended up getting in trouble for it and all that stuff. But the car wash, like, took me back. But it wouldn't be until – so I went to prison for selling drugs. And when I was 18, 19 years old, I How got out in jail. Like, uh, for two years. So I got out when I was, like, 21, 22, somewhere in there. It was like I went in in 2001 because I, I, I got – I went in 2000, got out the end of 2001. So uh, went back to the car wash and worked my way up to be a manager. And one of the regular people that came in the car wash, like at this time, no more drugs, no more nothing, dude. I'm straight and narrow, like screwed my life up. And I'm like, oh Jesus, now I'm a convicted felon. This car wash is the only thing I got. I dropped out of school. You know, I should make the most of it. Well, I worked my ass off there seven days a week, man. Like I was, I would vacuum, sell the car, wipe it off, dude, on slow days, whatever I had to do to stay on the clock, right? And one of the customers took notice to me and she said, you know, I'd like to give you a job. <clears throat> and I said, oh, that's cool. What do you do? She goes, uh, well, I run a, a, a financing company. And I was like, oh, dude, I'm definitely not your guy. I never had a car <laughs> paper or a credit card in my life. You know, it's like I, I know all things about washing cars. You know, I can tell you everything about the machine, but I know nothing about a credit score or finance or, like I said, that truck's paid for for cash and I don't have any debt, student loans. I rent an apartment with two of my friends. Like, and I'm a felon. She goes, uh, now you'd probably be perfect still. You know, we got other felons that work for us too. They'll still give you a license uh, as long as you, don't, you didn't steal money, did you? And I was like, no, it's for selling drugs. She goes, yeah, come on. So she convinced me and I was like, she said this. This is what happened. Sometimes people just say the right words. You go, no shit, huh? She said, what's the worst thing that can happen, Ryan? The car wash took you back fresh out of prison. Surely they'll take you back fresh from the bank. Yeah, you know? no shit. <laughs> Monica, Monica's dead now, man, but she was a closer. And, uh, and so <clears throat> I said, you know what? Shit. How can I say no to that? Went to work for it. Two weeks later, made 8,700 bucks. Three weeks after that, made another $14,000. Dude, I was like fucking young Bill Gates in my mind. Dude, I used to have to work a whole fucking year for that kind of money. And now all of a sudden I got it in like six or seven weeks. So boom, 2005 comes around, dude. I'm hitting up seminars because I sold mortgages. So I'm hitting up seminars. Everybody that's buying the package from the freaking flip or flop people and all that shit, dude, I'm hitting them up with, I got money. As soon as you find a house, I got money. And so, dude, I was going to all these seminars. I eventually started speaking at the seminars and flipping houses and shit on top of loaning money to all these people. And in 2005, I did $773,000 in personal income. Nice. So like four years after getting out of prison, two yep. years into the mortgage business, like, you know, 
And the cops thought I was selling drugs. That's why they kicked in my house. I didn't have any, kicked in the door of my house. I didn't have any drugs. And they busted me for firearms. They tried to give me some crazy, because I had, certain firearms are legal in Texas. Yeah. Did, so, you know, I, I want to add, did you always grow up in Texas? You always yeah. lived in Texas. Yeah, always. Okay. And, okay. And some firearms are legal in Texas and some aren't. Uh, some, some are legal in Texas that aren't legal on a federal level. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess, lucky me, I happen to have those motherfuckers. And it came <laughs> 20 years. They gave me 15 months. They reduced it to a different charge of international firearms. I'm like, I don't care what you call it as long as I've got to do 20 years, you know? So, Yeah, brutal, dude. So, I mean, there's, there's parts of your story that uh, I like. Like, I've just been way down on that side of the world. Like, so I've been sober for years now. Um, I had real, real bad drugs and alcohol, drug and alcohol problems, all, all the hard shit. Every good salesman has, man. If you're not a good salesman, if you ain't fucked your life up a time or two yet. <laughs> no shit, right? Um, and dude, it's so it's so interesting. Like you said at the beginning, you know, you needed to go, and just from the business side of things, it tends to be the same way in life. Like you gotta go through some shit to grow. Like you have to go through suffering to make some shit happen. Okay, but like at this point, things seem really good where we're at in the timeline, right? We know that you you lose your license in 2010. But what happened from 2005 to 2010? Because we went through a tough time there, you know, finding, like I was still, I'm 25 now. So I was still really young and I hadn't, I mean, dude, I didn't get into business until four years ago when I got out of rehab. And, uh, but there was a five year period there of financial insecurity at a nationwide level that you were, you know, a loan officer. What was going on in that time? Dude, it's like at the time, and, and I, I cannot stress this to the people listening and watching this, whatever. When life stresses you out, it's giving you a stress test. And when you pass that stress test, you get the reward. You see, so many people look at the situation they're in and they say, poor me, I'm a victim, this happened, this happened. The, man, think about, I didn't even tell you guys that I was adopted. I didn't even tell you guys that I've been dead before, right? I didn't even tell you guys fucking half the, I didn't even tell you a fraction of the shit that's happened to me in my life. But for some reason, I'm wired up here that I never, I never look at the darkness in the tunnel. I'm always looking for the light. So what happens is in 2005, the local police kicked my door in. And rightly so, in all reality, at the time it didn't make sense, but looking back on it, which I've thought about it a lot over the years, I ran a mortgage business and I worked from home. Like we had an office, but shit, all I needed was the internet. So I just worked from home. That wasn't a thing back then like it is now. Right. And I mean, this was before Uber, before Airbnb, before Amazon, you know what I mean? Right. Like these things, right. And so, and so the reason why I say this is I'm working from home, but I own like 32 investment properties. I have realtors coming to drop off contracts, right? Because that's how you did shit back then. I have that's people so coming to me. Yeah. I have people coming to drop off rent checks, people coming to drop off contracts, people signing papers. And so one minute, there might be somebody in a beat up piece of shit Kia Sophia from the hood paying me rent. And the next minute, there might be somebody in a $200,000 Mercedes Benz dropping off a real estate contract. So, and it's happening a lot. And real estate agents work in the nighttime. They might go show properties till nine o'clock and then come and drop a contract off at 10 on their way home. So somebody in my fucking neighborhood thinks I'm selling dope. <laughs> I mean, with I didn't, put two, I didn't put two and two together. I'm just running a business, right? But we got a lot of traffic, so the cops start watching me. They pull my record, and they're like, "Dude, he's definitely selling dope." Yeah, that's right. Sure. Or this is how he's bought this house. It all makes sense. He's a dropout, a dopehead, fucking idiot. How's he got this house and all these cars and shit like that? And so they kick in the door. I'm not even home, bro. I'm not even in the fucking country when they kicked in my door. I show up a couple days later, and they arrest me. You know what I mean? Like they've been looking for me, I guess, this whole thing. These fuckers threw a flash bomb in my house, raided, cut my couches open. There's not even an ounce of, I didn't even smoke weed at the time. There wasn't even a roach in my house. And so they did find this 357 Glock that I had with like 20 rounds in the chamber. And at the time, George Bush or Clinton, one of the two passed some weird gun law. You can only have 10 rounds in the clip. Fucking anyway, I beat the case. And I tried to sue the city because they fucked my house up. And they turned me over to the ATF who, was, who banned the fucking gun shit. So I go into prison for 15 months. 
And dude, I could tell you so much about that story. My lawyer that I hired ended up being the first black Democrat ever elected district attorney of Dallas County, the second biggest county in Texas. And he pulled favors for me. It's fucking nuts. But so, so I get put in prison. Three months after I'm in there, my wife divorces me, tells me she's leaving me for the landscaper and spending all my money and selling all my houses. So at that point, most people would have done this. Exactly. Right. Out. But for some reason, I'm wired, like, can't beat me. You know, it's like, he's like, whatever we're doing, you're not going to beat me. I'm, you may win today, but you're not going to win the war. And so I went into prison, and it was crazy because in the mortgage business, like you said, everything was falling apart. Well, fuck, my world had already fell apart anyway. I don't give two fucks. So, so you said something. I, I want to pause you there for a minute because you said something. And before you mentioned it as well, you said you were always looking for the light. Like, is that something? Were you always that way, dude? Like, always looking for the positive? Always, dude. I'm looking for the outcome. Not necessarily the positive, the outcome. Right? Not, not, not where I'm at. Not my current situation. What's the outcome of it? So I go to prison. that as long as you can remember. As long as I can remember, man. Because it, it, I had to work so since I was eight years old. So like being at work 10 hours a day when I was 14, 15, 16 years old, dude, I'm like focused on the outcome of the day. All the, how, how long should we get off fucking work? You know? Yep. And so I go into prison. Three months later, the wife leaves me. First, you know, I go in there and I'm going to write a book and I'm going to be a better husband and all this stuff. She leaves me. And I go dark for, you know, probably two weeks, you know, like, fuck, God damn, you know, really, <laughs> really? I was doing the right thing out there, you know? And I said, you know what? Fine. I'm going to get out. I'm going to be on my own. I'm not going to have any money. What am I going to do? I've still got 14 months left in this bitch. I'm going to read a book a day. I'm going to watch CNBC all day long while everybody's on their job. I'm going to watch TV. I'm going to learn the markets. I'm going to get smarter. I'm going to educate myself and I'm going to get a PhD in college in the time that I'm gonna be in here. And that's the fuck I did. I read every business, every personal development, every book, everything that I could get my hands on. I get out July 11th, 2008, and it, it's like, it's crazy how things work. So at the time, think about this, while everybody's life's falling apart, I get out July 11th, 2008, it's like a fucking ghost town in the mortgage world. There's tumbleweeds just like rolling across the freaking cubicles that used to be packed with people making calls, right? I'm like, damn, I don't want to get back in that industry. So I go apply for this job. I make the first round interview. And the second round interview, they tell me because of my record, they can't hire me. So I go to, and man, I've never been turned down for a job before. Shit fucked me up. You know what I mean? So I go settle for this mortgage job. I'm like, shit, I better go back to mortgages, you know? So I go take this mortgage job. Within two months, I'm the top producer in the mortgage company. Within three months, one night I'm sitting up at work, working late. I look up at the TV. The place that denied me for a job got raided by the feds for fucking fraud. Imagine if I'd have been in that motherfucker, dude. They would have definitely arrested me. I'd have been the top producer, and I would have been there with two criminal records. I'd be locked up for life right now. I'd never be yeah, here. Yeah, you'd be fucked. You'd be, I'd be fucked. fucked. They never believed that I didn't know. You know what I mean? Never. never. And so... I go there and I make the most of this situation in 2009. See, I was gone for 15 months. So when I got out, I needed to get my I had shit. I went in a millionaire left with $25 to my name. So dude, the light at the end of the tunnel for me was like, get a job, make money fast. So I get a job in the mortgage business. You know, the first month I make two or 3,000. Next month I make seven to 10 grand. By the third month, I'm printing $20,000 a month again, just like that, right? Come right. talk to the company. And so here's what happened. In the financial crisis, everybody was constantly quitting, right? Because I got out in 08. By 09, everybody had left. Dude, my whole business plan was when you left the mortgage business, Brody, I'll call you up and be like, hey, man, what are you doing with all your realtor contacts? Nice. Hey, man, somebody's going to need to take care of them. I got no choice. I'm a convicted felon. I got stuck in this fucking business. You're lucky you're getting out of it. Can I at least take care of your people? And they all knew I was a good loan officer, so they start sending their business my way. You know, next thing you know, shit, I'm, I become this unstoppable machine until Obama signed that, the Dodd-Frank thing into act, uh, the Dodd-Frank act into law. And uh, they said, you know, March of, or was it April of 2010, you can no longer originate mortgages without a federal license and they wouldn't give me one. And, uh, mm -hmm. but up until then, like I got out and my solution was, look, I lost everything. How fast can I get it back? Boom. Let me get in the mortgage business and sling mortgages, you know? Yeah. And, and luckily, I, I, I had learned some lessons, and I lived way below my means. So while I'm making 300 grand a year, 
I'm living way well below my means. Do I live in like a $90,000 house or some shit like that, right? Like just yeah, way yeah. out on the lake, stacking money. And thank God, because dude, when they pulled the plug, I had a little bit of savings saved up to be able to do this shit, you know, to, to, to last me for a little while. You know, it, so, it okay. Dude, it all, but... right at this moment, though, you make such a fucking wild card move to become <laughs> an internet marketer. Like, there was, like, who else was even around at that time doing ads? Uh, Frank, and they didn't do ads. They built email lists, right? They built email lists, right. Like, it was Frank Kern and Ryan Dice and Andy Jenkins. That was fucking it. And that was fucking it. Because, like, yeah. dude, I, I remember, so, you know, I got, into, I got into sales as a real estate agent uh, right out of rehab because there was a low, I, I was a college dropout junkie, like, totally unemployable, like you low barrier to entry, take the class, pass the test. And I remember, and see, I, you know, I grew up in a different time. So, but still I was finding you, I was finding Grant Cardone. And that was really, and I was finding some Jordan Belfort at that time on sales information. Right. So dude, I studied before and before I became really obsessed with personal development, like I, like every young entrepreneur was like money hungry first. Right. Right. Not the shit that actually matters. Uh, yeah. But then dude, I was like, I went hard. I sold 46 homes my first year in my first eight months. And it was all on your guys' you the two of your content, really. And That's dude, like I was getting hit with your ads before anyone else. I dude, I didn't have an Instagram until 18 months ago. I didn't know that this world existed. But oh, I've, dude, been, I've been in the game for a long time, man. I've been running Facebook ads since like 2012, I think, you know? So, I mean, I've been at them for a long time, like heavy since 2012, you know? Yeah, that's fucking crazy. So, okay, so you- You and said I'm, something that I, I want to mention real quick. You know, you said you get all about money until you find out what you're supposed to do. And, and, and I have this, at least this is what's come true in my life. You got to get the money first. And then once you secure the bag, you can figure out what you want to do in life. But it was, thank you. that first million for me, like I had come close in 2005, but let's be honest, every, money was everywhere in 2005. It's not that way and, and it won't ever be that way again. We had to get $700 billion to the banks because it was that way. So had I known now, what, known then when I know now, I made 7 million, you know what I mean? Probably more than that. But so to, to further the point though, you know, that first million's hard. And dude, I, I used to spend 12, 13, 15 hour days just behind the computer, just like learning. Like we had to code shit. Phone sites wasn't out yet. Click funnels, none of that stuff was out yet. So we had to code websites and everything else, dude. You had to, rev.com didn't exist. You had to actually write fucking books and shit like that, dude. It was, it was nuts, man. It was a full-time gig. But what happened was, that, you know, uh, in 2015 or 16, it was my first seven-figure year. Right, think about that. I've been at this shit since 2010. I have my first seven figure year. So when you see people pop up and, and say big numbers, a lot of time shit is bullshit. I'm telling you because I've been through this stuff, right? And and so I have that first seven figure year. I look up, I got extra cash. I paid my taxes off. I paid a lot of stuff off. I, I have been making money anyway. So now all of a sudden I got a lot of extra cash. And for me, that's when I started saying, okay, so I'm gonna invest my cash, blah, blah, blah. After two years of it, because the next year we made like five million. So like after two years of having an infinite supply of fucking money, all of a sudden money's not a driver anymore, right? Then all of a sudden I have to figure out what that driver is. And the driver for me is changing people's lives. As a matter of fact, a lot of my shit's got less expensive as I've made more money because I want to have an impact on more people, not because it's not valued the same. And it's because I want to help. Us, I, I, like I always tell people, whether you buy from me today or not, my life's not going to change because someone will, right? But it, it might change yours. But for me, that driver now is the significance of leaving a legacy of people saying, just like you, hey, I did this because I didn't even know you listened to my shit. You know what I mean? Like, we never had that conversation before, but you're like, I did this because of you. That's what's more important to me these days. Well, dude, so it, it, it's such an important lesson because you're absolutely right. Like, you got to get that fuck, you got to get fucking money good. And I'm glad that I, I took that route. And so, like, I say that I had, like, my midlife crisis at 22, like, my parents were 17 when they had me. Like I grew up not like my childhood was great. My parents were great, but like I grew up in a nice part of town too, but I was the poor kid on that side of town. And so I always had this real negative relationship with money. That was my fault, right? I was always driven by that like thought. And I thought that a hundred thousand dollars was going to solve all my problems. I grew up in Missouri. That's dude. What our parents told us. 
that's right. that's what because that's what their grandparents told them or whatever, you know. Right. And then, so, and then dude, you know, I thought, okay, I hit the hundred. I'm like, okay, 200, 300, right? Like what, when is it going to fulfill me? And what I came down to dude, is I had built three ventures to a multiple six figure level, nothing crazy. And I was like, fuck man, I don't, I, I don't lo love the first two that I built. The third one was uh, in the payment processing space. I still do merchant accounts. Um, but I had to get into, I had to get online. And I, I came to that conclusion because I realized that the only time in my life that I was truly fulfilled, like had that thing was whenever I was helping other young alcoholics achieve sobriety. Like that was big for me. I got that fulfillment that I wanted when I was working with them. And then I noticed I got a similar fulfillment working with my team and just all mindset. I became obsessed with the human condition. And now dude, like, yeah, like we're, I'm going to fucking scale any venture I do huge because that's the kind of guys we, you know, are, there's no, uh, the uh, other option is shit. But like, there's some people, dude, I wonder, like, you got, you think like super rich dudes, right? Like just fucking a hundred billion. I'm like, how do you still like making money? Well, you know, uh, and my let and Andy for are friends of mine. And I, I just spoke at their event on Saturday. I saw that. So that was in St. Louis, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I live, uh, I live just a couple hours south of there. Oh, Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I spoke at their event, you know, and, and both of them have billion dollar companies yes, and yes. both of them have nine figure net worths, you know? And so it, it gets to a point for them where, you know, I can tell you, it buys you significance and freedom. It buys you a, a better circle. It buys you a little bit more luxury. It buys you a little bit more time. And so when you start making that money, money's not the driver anymore. Money wasn't the driver for me after I became worth about 10 million. It's like, it was not really, you know, I grew up poor, doing pretty easy to please. Like last That's year, I bought, last year I bought my first Rolex and I've still figured out ways to drive exotic cars for free, basically. Right. I'll, I'll front the money up front and them on the back end. So, you know, a lot of people look at it and they're like, Sue is blowing money left and right, but I'm actually not that fucking stupid, you know? And so I, I know how to come up with this stuff really well. And so, the driver for me is, like I said, it's like, what else can I do? And it's the same for Ed and Andy. It's like, what else can I do? It's like, okay, I bought a nice house. I got cars. I got no debt and everything. Okay, that's cool. But like, what's next? You know what I mean? It's like, okay, cool. How much can I get done in this period of time? How can I optimize my body? How can I work on my mind? And instead of having to go to work immediately every day, how can I meditate for an hour a day and work out for another hour a day? How can I afford to have an, a housekeeper and a chef to take care of me, right? So that I can live longer, so that I can bring a more significant impact. So it doesn't become about how can I make more money? It's like, these are the things that I need to do and more money is what fuels those actually happening. Look at Elon Musk, right? And Jeff Bezos. They become worth billions of dollars, and they're like, "Fuck it, we're going to the moon." <laughs> right? Yeah, I know, dude. They're just we're like, going to Mars, right? Like, you know, shit, there's, <laughs> gotta be, there's gotta be a bigger driver than the income you're currently at, and I'd say going to fucking Mars is a little bigger than a hundred billion dollars. You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, you know, I guess fucking McKinsey got thirty of it. <laughs> you know, you brought you brought up some really interesting stuff there that, like, I'm just like incredibly passionate about. Um, is you said that you know, like what's always next? Like, how can I meditate an hour a day? How can I push my body the most? Like, dude, I'm so obsessed with performance. Like right now I am training for a 50 mile ultra marathon. I'm running my first, I'm running my first marathon April 27th this month. I've done three halves this year, but in December I couldn't run a mile and I was like pretty fit. But so like, I've really been scratching the surface of like where I can push myself from a mental toughness perspective and I'm pretty confident, like running a lot. I picked, I chose running because it was the thing I hated most in the world. And I'm pretty Goggins sure he does it. You got David Goggins, a friend of mine. That's why he does it because he fucking hates it. Yeah, like and dude, he's sick. Like it's so okay. So yeah, let's talk about Goggins. Goggins. I thought I was a pretty tough dude, right? Like I've been through like hard drug addiction, and I've grown some businesses. I fucking like I thought I was pretty tough. You know, there's people who have it way worse, always or whatever. You know, but like he made me crack open the hood from a mental toughness perspective. And I was like, damn, I'm just not where I could be. And now like running dude, I swear to God is the vehicle that's going to take my business to the next level. Yep. That's like working out for me. You know, uh, I have a personal trainer who's a complete dickhead 
and uh, makes me do torturous shit every day. You know what I mean? I don't really care for the guy too much, but he's done done good for me, you know. And so Did you now, just say you don't care for the guy that much? Yeah, man. You know, he gets my <laughs> money and he makes me look good. But fuck, dude, he's he's a he's a nice guy, man. But he's, he makes me do crazy fucking shit, right? So, but because of that, I'm in great shape, you know. And 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 the thing is, though, I, I'm the same way. I'm performance driven, and when I'm in there you know, and sweating and out of breath and, and pushing the sled one more time or running one more mile or whatever the case it is that I'm in there doing, you know, shit, that's when I get the best part of me out. Those, the, like, you know, when you're running, that's when you have your best thoughts. You know yeah. what I mean? When you have your most clarity. And, and running, to me, is a mental battle between your conscious saying, dude, slow it down, take a break, get some water, take a piss, and your subconscious going, dude, we're only running at about 20%, keep rolling, you know? And it's yeah. truly a battle of your like right brain and left brain, your hard drive and your read only random access memory. So it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool, man. 50 miles. That's, that's cool. I just did a Ford for a book and, uh, the gentleman that wrote the book ran a hundred mile ultra marathon. Oh no. Who was it? Uh, this guy's name's Nate Bailey. Hmm. Yeah. Dude, I'll still look him up. Yeah. Dude yeah. from Wisconsin. And so uh, his book should be out in a couple weeks. I, a lot of people hit me up that, uh, that I have relationships with that want me to write forwards for their books and stuff like that, you know, and, and uh, he's one of them. But anyway, yeah, running's, running's a hell of a, a hell of a mental toughness thing. That's why David does it, you know, and, and David mentored me for about six months uh, the year before last, before he was big and uh, before he blew up and all that stuff and his book came out and everything else. And I see talent early and jump on it. You know what I mean? Totally. And, uh, Anyway, long story short, man, you know, that was, that's the whole reason why he does all that stuff, man, is because it makes you push past your limit. And I guarantee if you push past your limit in the 50 miler, right, if I push past my limit while I'm in the gym, right, if I push past my limit, like, hey, I want to go home now, but if I just do one more hour of work, it'll be like three hours of work minus the distractions in the morning or whatever the case, man, we should be chasing that every day. And, and when you get enough money to where you really can focus on that, you'll find yourself actually being fulfilled and finding that, you know, that's why you see guys that have a shitload of money and they still drive beat up cars and live in. The guy that I worked for at the bank, he had like, dude, he had like the shittiest car out of everybody that worked in the company. He had a house where bricks were falling off the side. And I know he was worth 30 million cash because we had to have that put up against the warehouse line to be able to do the amount of volume and loans that we were doing, you know? But it wasn't money that was the driver for him. It wasn't cars and status and all that other stuff like it is for some of us. It was just simply like, how many houses can we do? How many mortgages can we push? How many lives can we, we change and enhance and make better, you know? Dude, it's interesting shit. And so, like, the reason I'm so obsessed with it is because I think that it's this, like, stack of skills that actually matters. Like, right now, like, my brand, what I talk about, everything that I just, like, live and preach is totally, I feel just different than what a lot of guys my age are talking about. You get into the guys like Ed, Andy, yourself, guys who have been through the deal talking about shit that matters. Like you guys fucking know the sauce. It's like, you need to be consistent as fuck. You need to be disciplined. But right now, every other 25 year old is out there talking about, you, you know, they've got cars and all the shit that they're putting on Instagram. And like, I'm like, I feel like the only one talking about like, Hey, discipline and consistency is the fucking shortcut. And like self mastery is the play. Like, dude, if you can master your mind, just so, like alone, the ability to stay calm under pressure, like you were talking about earlier, that's the number one skill. That's the number one skill and nobody's fucking teaching it, dude. Dude, my real estate agent told me the other day, <clears throat> he's like, because I flip a lot of properties still. And he's like, dude, I don't see how you don't have meltdowns on like a daily basis. And I'm like, man, those meltdowns don't do me any good. I'm grateful for the struggle. I'm grateful for the challenge. Listen, I'm a fucking problem solver by nature. That's what I do. That's why I'm such a good salesperson. I'm not trying to sell you some shit. I'm trying to solve your problems. Check your boxes, yeah. And in order for me to be a problem solver, I got to have problems. So I thrive in that shit. And I don't get all frustrated, poor me, fucking blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, now I get to do what I do best. There's a problem. Let me solve it, you know? Yeah, dude, I love it. I love it. I mean, because that's the deal. Like, if you can just... If you can get out of the victim mindset and stay present for even just, because it's always right now, you know, that's what matters. None of that shit, that, everything that has happened up until now does not matter for what you're going to do today. And it's usually not as bad as you make it out to be anyway. You know, I've learned, I've overreacted enough in my life to know that overreaction is always the wrong thing to do. 
you know? And, and so I just, again, I stay focused on that solution, that light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. So that's, that's a really interesting thing right there because like for me, dude, I struggled with that. Like, to be honest, like whenever I was 20, I was just entitled. I was, I was mental pussy. Like, you know, I, I just did not have what it took and I had to figure that shit out. And for me, dude, it was like, I had ego problems. You know, I thought that I was this big hotshot when in reality I'd never done anything. And I had to learn how to pause and just be like, what would a more, how would a more humble person react? in this situation? How would a more grateful person react in this situation? And it helped me get through to like what I need. Um, I know that we've, we're coming up on time here. I want to, uh, I want to talk a little bit about your routine. Like we've talked about a lot of good stuff. Like, Hey, this shit matters. Be consistent, fucking learn skills that pay, earn you money. But like, dude, how do you, how do you keep it together? How do you not have meltdowns? What'd you tell that guy other than I problem solve? Well, so I, I live by something we call the G code and uh, we teach it to our clients and we have, you know, thousands of people that live their life this way. You see this, this planet is nothing more than a simulation. It's coded. Whether you want to say that we're organically living or artificially intelligent, like we could argue that for forever. But the bottom line is this thing was uh, assembled and coded for us to live here and coexist with fish and birds and rocks and trees. And some people believe God created it, which would be like him coding it, right? Some people believe that Allah and some people believe other things, right? Ra, the sun God, whatever it is. And, and the bottom line is, let's just say something created this, but let's just pretend that something created it on a computer. That, that's like more logical for what we know right now too, right? Easy to wrap our heads around. They launch yeah. the program, they pull the switch, there's the big bang and here we are, okay? So in this program, we were coded, our character, like just when you're sliding through the characters on a video game, our character is set up for strengths, weaknesses, just like when you pick a car out of a racing game, it's got good handling, fast engine, or bad handling and faster engine. Yeah. We're all, we're all created equal, meaning our parents had sex, but we are not equal, right? I am not Michael Jordan. I can't shoot a basketball for shit. I am not Troy Aikman. I can't throw a football for shit. We, we're all created equal in the sense that our parents had to bang to create us, right? Other than that, there is no equality once we leave the womb. I don't give a shit who tells you that or what, what religion. <laughs> I don't understand that. So we were created and coded with something we're supposed to do on this planet. For me, I was supposed to be doing what I do right now, inspiring people, motivating people, moving people. Some people, they're coded to be singers. Some people, they're coded to be plumbers. Some people are coded to be teachers, teaching and police officer. That's something you grow up with in your DNA. That job doesn't pay you a lot of money. That job is something that you grow up coded to do. Nobody says, I'm going to go get rich and be a cop. That's not what happens, right? You're like, dude, I'm programmed to be a paramedic. I'm programmed to be a nurse, right? Like, you know, it's like, how did you know what you were going to be in life, right? And so the reason why I share that with you is you're coded for greatness. But there was a virus unleashed in this program centuries upon centuries ago that I call the force of average. We've read tons of religious books. But those are the oldest books. We see tons of religious books where kings conquered and conquested and took over territory only to fall victim to some chick and get caught in some kind of bullshit trap, right? We've seen guys that have conquered the world and then their ego cost them everything. And we've seen guys that have conquered the world and then turned into a villain from the hero that they started out with, you know? And so I call that the force of average. For us, everyday people, that is a good month in sales followed by a shitty month in sales. That's finding the woman of your dreams and then fucking some fat girl that you met at a bar one night when you're drunk and she finding out that you fuck up the girl of your dreams and you didn't even mean to. That's force of average shit. Right? Like, I'm just being, we've all been there, right? It happens to all of us, right? And so, my life, as I told you a little bit about, it's been full of these ups and downs. A couple of years ago, I got tired of the downs. 2010 was my last fucking down. When they kicked me out of the mortgage business, that was the last time you were going to hold this hunting dog down. That was it. So, for a long time, I start searching on how the fuck am I going to figure out this shit. Turns out, the force of average has this, which is what I call the virus, right? The force of average has one job and one job only to distract you. The force of average throws up about 5,000 advertisements a day. 
It throws up bullshit troll posts and clickbait on social media. It throws haters at you. It throws problems at you. It throws your kids getting sick at school. It throws your employees. It throws people getting chargebacks. You name it, the force of average is trying to keep you distracted. Why? Because as superhumans, our only power is focus. When you're focused and in the zone, you're unstoppable. For those of you listening, think about it. The last time that you were focused and in your zone, whatever it is that you're working on became a reality. I know every time that I've been focused and in the zone, whatever I wanted became a reality. So most of us say stuff like, I need to level up. I need to get to the next level. But we don't clearly know what that is. Or we say, I need to focus. Or what's worse, most of people's inner dialogue is, I have ADD. I don't pay attention to details. We're programming ourselves for the exact opposite thing that we need in order to be successful, which is focus. And so I cracked the code. You can't hack this code. You can't change this code. you got to live by this code. And once I give it to you here in a second, you have a choice. There's no going back. You either, there's three types of people. There's the people that say it can't be that easy and they don't do it. There's the people that say, I, whatever other, I don't have time. That's not real. The skeptics, they won't do it. But there's the third person that actually takes action. And they look up six months, a year from now, and they've been focused on living life by this G code. This is not the gangster code, by the way. It's the code of greatness. And, and so when you look up, your life will change. But it's not going to change overnight. The things I tell you to do today is not going to change your life tomorrow. Six months from now, you'll be a complete 180. A year from now, you won't even be the same person. So there's four areas in life that we got to focus on every single day. So my routine works like this. First thing in the morning when I wake up, I immediately pull out my phone and I open up Evernote and I write down five things that I'm grateful for. I've been doing this for 414 days. Today was my 414th day. Excellent. From there, so because here's what I know. As a guy who's had it, lost it, had it, lost it, had it, got it back again, you'll never get what's next if you're not grateful for what's now. So the first thing that I'm doing every single morning is I'm kickstarting my heart. I'm kickstarting my mind with things to be thankful for. I don't wake up and go, what are they saying about Trump this morning? Or why isn't Hillary president? I don't fucking do that. What I do is I wake up and I'm like, man, I love my wife. Man, this bitch. Fuck shit. yeah. Fuck yeah. That's what I'm focused on. That's what I want my mind to think first thing in the morning. Because if I'm not grateful for what I have now, I won't get what's next. And here's the thing. Everybody tells you to be an abundant thinker. And you won't be an abundant thinker if you're not grateful. It's impossible because if you're not grateful, you're fearful. And fearful is a scarcity mentality because you're scared you're going to lose shit. Look at guys like Bill Gates. He gave away $50 billion. Now he's worth 90. Give it all away. It comes back. Right? Especially if you give it to the right areas. And so I'm going to focus on being grateful. Uh, five things. Next thing is I'm going to the gym. The next G is genetics. So the first G is a, a grateful mindset. The next G is your genetics. Right? And genetics isn't just the gym. Okay, because like we all hear the saying, abs are made in the kitchen. And it's not that you just want abs and all that shit. That's not, that's not what it's about. But I have one mission on this planet. My mission is to match my reality to the most elite version of myself. And it comes down to focusing in these four areas. Part of being elite is having an elite mindset and having an elite body. The last thing I want to do is make all these millions of dollars and give it to a hospital to stay alive when I'm 70 or 80 years old because I abused myself and didn't exercise and didn't eat properly. And it's little things, like I just cut out a little bit of calories, right? I might eat something, I might eat a salad instead of a hamburger. Just little tweaks, man. I'm not over here hardcore carb counting and keto diet and taking 10 shits and drinking 10 gallons of water every day. I got to do all that, right? I just, man, I might eat a half a hamburger instead of a full one. I might eat one piece of pizza instead of three. I might not have french fries with my meal. I might eat a salad for dinner instead of a steak. Just little, little tweaks like that make all the difference, okay, working on your genetics. The next thing is your grind. And here's the biggest lie that we're told. We're told you got to find work-life balance. Man, how the fuck are you going to do that? If you got to work six hours a day, you expect to hang out with your family for fucking six hours a day? What about the hour back and forth you got to drive to work, right? What about the hour or two that you spend every day going to the bathroom, whether you realize it or not? What about the fucking time you got to go? There is no work-life balance. It's fucking stupid. So instead, what you have to do is you have to make the time count. So while I'm on my grind, I'm focused on my grind. Now, here's how I do that. I don't have a boss. I don't have a manager. I don't have a supervisor. But I got a calendar. And that calendar is my boss. And it holds me accountable. And I live my life focused on knocking out those items on that calendar. If there's no more shit on the calendar, guess what? I can go home. But I can't go. It's just like having a boss. I can't go home until I've done all the shit on my calendar. And I put everything on the calendar. Date night with the wife. 
playing with the kids, the sports games, the freaking meetups with my homies. I got to go to a concert on Friday night with my lawyer. I got all this shit on my calendar. I live and die by it. My day is not over until the calendar is complete. I live by it. Why? Because I'm making time matter. But I'm also scheduling not just work shit, I'm scheduling home shit too. Because I'm going to make the time matter. I need something to focus on. I need a clear defined outcome. And the fourth G is group. The group of people you're surrounded with. If your net worth is your net worth, I want my net worth to be love and money. Right? Those are the two things that matter the most in this planet. Because you can have all the love in the world. If you ain't got no money, you ain't getting a fucking bus ticket. So you need both of them. Right? Love, money, they, those two things can get you air, water, food, all the other shit that you need, right? And so here's the thing. You got to focus on the group of people in your house, your family of choice, your kids, your wife, your husband, your mom, your dad. You got to focus on your employees. They're your group. They're people that you got to take care of. You got to focus on your clients. They're important. You know, they kind of pay your bills whether you realize it or not. You got to focus on your referral partners. And you got to be a good friend. So many people are shitty friends. Like I go, like Friday, I'm going to a concert with my lawyer. He's a good friend of mine. You know, like I'm going, going out of our way to make sure that we hang out with a couple other friends, right? We're all busy. Right. My lawyer did $3 billion worth of fucking settlements. That dude's a busy motherfucker, but we make time because they live by the G code too. And once you get cracked in and focus every day on those four areas, you become unstoppable. And here's what I do the last thing before I go to sleep every night. I open up that same little Evernote and I write, I look at my calendar and I write down everything that was a win for me for the day. So I wake up in the morning grateful to be alive and I go to sleep knowing I'm a motherfucking winner. And that's how I stick to the G code every day. Can't go a little bit deeper than that, but that's the 10 minute version there for you. Yeah, dude, I love it. I love it. I fuck, I fuck with you. Right. <laughs> Straight up. Like there, there's few people who out there and like, I, I respect everyone in their, in their fields and what they've done or, you know, I just don't like, I, I don't judge. Right. But, uh, dude, people who live that, like, as soon as you're like, there's four fucking areas that you need to focus on. I was like, yeah, we're about to get in some good shit. Like you notice at the beginning of the podcast, I'm like, we max out mind, body, spirit, business. That's it. That's it. That's man. Our four areas that's awesome. that the first time that I learned it, it was Ford, family, occupation, recreation, dream. So what I'm doing here is, is I'm not reinventing the wheel. What happens is I found these four things the same way that you found them on your journey, the same way that whoever taught us Ford found them on their journey, the same way Kevin Nations founded the four Fs or Garrett J. White founded the core four. The they core four, yeah. Discover these things on our journey. We're like, oh, shit, I got a buddy that discovered seven. I don't know if he's next level or a little bit behind, but he's discovered seven. But, but guess what? Four of them are the same fucking things that I focus on. Yep. You know what I mean? So it, it really does, no matter who you look at, if you read Warren Buffett's biography, if you read Jeff Bezos' book, if you read books about Bill Gates or Elon Musk, they're all focused on those four areas. And in their story, anytime they're not focused on all four, the force of average hits them and fucks up their marriage like Jeff Bezos just had to go through. Right? Imagine making all that money being focused on work. And then all of a sudden you get focused on your fitness too and you fuck up with your group. Yep. $35 billion later. Right? Which ain't such a bad deal when you got his money. But if you got a hundred grand and she takes 35, you are fucked. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's a big difference, man. 35 billion out of a hundred. Ah, hell, he couldn't spend it anyway. You know, she's with his kids. But shit, for the rest of us, if you make a hundred grand, if you make a million, she takes 350,000, like shit, you're in trouble. So, you yeah, know, well, I mean, moral of the story, that fucking sucked for him too. Like he, that sucked for him too. Like that fucking sucks. And I, I love this force of average shit that you, that you talk about, dude, because you're right. Like the first thing you said is like, have a great sales month followed by a shitty salesman, right? Dude, you need the consistent, consistency is the shortcut. Because like you said, it's not going to give you results right now, right? It may not give you that instant gratification, which is what everybody's trying to buy in a course or in a mentor, in a coach, whatever the fuck they buy, they want that instant gratification, those instant results. But dude, you get 1% better, or in fact, if you get 0.28% better and compound that over a year, you'll double your results. And Man. Always. I've lived a, an interesting life and I'm telling you things are the way that they are because I'm focused on this G code. Notice I'm focused on being grateful and winning. So when things that don't, things that happen that cause me to typically take a loss, I st I'm not focused on that. Okay. I took a loss. What's next? Where can we win again? I'm not saying most people dwell over the loss. Oh my God, a loss, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, fuck it. Where can we win again? 
Like with Jeff Bezos, that's a great example. It's like, okay, you lost $35 billion. It's cool. I got all the voting rights for Amazon. Where can we maximize and get that money back real quick? Yeah. yeah back, dude. back to the solution, you know? So thanks for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Ab absolutely, dude. Absolutely. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you wrap it up and tell everybody where they can find you? Well, I think for the, the, the first thing I would say for the topic that we talked about here, if you want to know more about the Force of Average and stuff, go to forceofaverage.com. Uh, there's a video over there. It's 37 minutes. It'll make you cry. It'll fuck you up, man. But it, it, you probably need to watch it for that reason. You know what I mean? It's okay to be a little bit of a pussy sometimes. Um, there's also something for sale there. You know, if you like what you saw, the, the video is not a pitch fest. The video is some real shit. Like I said, it'll make you cry. Uh, but an opportunity to buy something there for like a hundred bucks, a couple hundred bucks that help you with your mindset stuff. As far as me, find me on Instagram at hardcore closer. I am the uh, Ryan Steumann with the blue check on Facebook. That's the profile that I'm actually active on, but I'm at Hardcore Closer on Instagram. That's, that's pretty much it. You can go to HardcoreCloser.com, check out our podcast and all that shit there. But really, like, fuck everything else. If you don't do anything that I just talked about, follow me anywhere. Just go watch the video at ForceOfAverage.com. Hell yeah. Thanks for coming on, brother. Really appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate you having me, man. Peace.